Hey, what's up everyone? You are listening to The J, episode 21 of the Tetsudo Moke Podcast edition. And I uh, just want to say, how is everyone doing today? Um, interesting news from Japan is that um, for the first time in recorded history, that uh, the cherry blossoms have been blooming early, very early. Well, 10 days early. Usually in the Kanto area, and even some areas of Kansai, you, you're used to seeing it usually on the final week of March and the first week of April before uh, before everything is, disappears. But this time around, the, uh, the blooming just started uh, this week, and uh, that's early. <laughs> it's only March 14th, and the reason that... Uh, the Japanese Meteorological um, Agency, and uh, I believe there was another weather-related agency. They said it has to do with global warming, and that um, it has been warmer um, in this part of um, March than um, in previous years. So these last three years have um, have been pretty pretty interesting. And that's just not in, just in Japan. I mean, look what's happening in the U.S., especially California. You have areas that have not experienced any major flooding, and and uh, it's been in a drought. And I think, if anything, now we are seeing um, intense rain, even uh, funnel clouds and large pieces, like large uh, hail. And this is something that you usually don't see in uh California. California, usually during this time, it's warming up, it's going to be dry, and um, all it's been is that uh, there's been a lot of flooding, and uh, yeah, it's it's a little crazy. So, um, speaking of Japan, I hope that um, many of, uh, of you who are planning to go, just please remember three QR codes, remember that. Or else you're going to be waiting in the uh, in the uh, airport for a long time. So, so I know a lot of you are excited to travel. And it's all good. It's all good. But just remember your three QR codes. And um, if you are planning to, um, you know, if you're a foodie and you're planning there to uh, go check out like Okonomiyaki and all these a lot of places, or even uh, Omo Rice. Uh, just know that uh, this month alone, um, a lot of restaurants have been announcing that they're having to um, temporarily close their stores or to uh, to find different alternatives um, because there was an egg shortage due to the uh, bird flu. So even McDonald's Japan just announced today that uh, their popular teriyaki um tamago um burger or so will be uh um will be not canceled i think i think they well they said they're going to re- replace it for now with uh with uh cheese uh like uh well i think it becomes like a cheese teriyaki burger but for the most part um that's the only alternative they have there's a shortage of eggs in japan and it's unfortunate and um also, another major news is uh, Chicago Pizza, which has been around in uh, Osaka for since the 1986 or so. They just filed bankruptcy. They said that even though that uh, travel is picking up and um, you know the coronavirus is you know dwindling, you know the pandemic has dwindled down and they're starting to see business again. Unfortunately, the cost of uh, ingredients is higher, and of course. Uh, they just can't keep up. Um, it's just they're losing money, and they will be fil- filing bankruptcy. So, some bad news there in, in Japan as of late when it comes to you know certain uh, certain businesses. But in terms of uh, the railroad, um, the railways, uh, there's quite a few uh, new trains, right? That uh, that uh, I, I know that a lot of you who haven't been in Japan for the last few years. Are probably excited to see. So, um, even myself, it's. <laughs> I I really I was hoping to go there again, 2020, and then 
everything has been canceled due to the pandemic. And then this year I can't go because due to uh, some health related issue that uh, I have to get uh, some go through some medical tests. So uh, it's kind of I'm putting that as the priority. My health as a priority and um, traveling will have to wait. But knock on wood, I hope I get to go there maybe next year or so. So what we're going to do today is we're going to go ahead uh, and uh, look at uh, uh, through Amazon. I was just kind of curious, what are the most expensive Tomix or Green Max trains? And you could see different sets here, but um, I've always been told that this uh, this one right here is one of the most expensive, but usually you know um as i was going through the prices and to seeing you know how much things are worth this one you can understand it's an ho gauge but the twilight express um um i have been wanting this for the longest time my goodness it looks so elegant when you the music cause it just looks very elegant the amount of detail is just really awesome I do have the Twilight Express, but it's the train ver regular train version that ended, what, 2016 or so? This is uh, another luxury car, and look at this. It has a little snazzy <laughs> um, case to it, So, but uh, I like how it comes with uh, the 10 trains, and it's probably one of the nicest looking trains um, available, but again, you're going to have to pay... Um, quite a bit because uh, six hundred thousand yen. Let's see what does that what does that uh, translate to in U.S. dollars? No, so it's four hundred forty-eight dollars and fifty-eight cents. And um, we're gonna go ahead and I'm gonna copy and paste this, and I'm gonna put it into Hobby Search. And see what the original price was. And the original price of was thirty one six eighty. So it was under three hundred dollars uh, back when it was released in November two thousand nineteen. But that's how things are. I'm I'm not sure if this is a limited edition release, but um, I think this is probably one of the more expensive ones that I've seen on Amazon. Um, the other one, this one, the ten one six four four. Let's go to, to let's go to this, and look at this. I wonder if it's meant, they meant to say sapphire or is it just sapphire? I have no idea. But it's the Odorico. And what is up with these Odoricos? They tend to go up in price quite a bit. Um, so this one was originally was released in late March 2021 and 26224 so it was under it was probably about 225 bucks or so and now it's pretty much almost doubled so that kind of shows you how these special editions they tend to go up in price but um Again, it all comes down to how much one is willing to spend on it. Um, it's a really nice looking train. It's only eight, but it's a really beautiful train. Is it um, nearly five? Is it worth the near? You know, nearly four hundred bucks for it, U.S. dollars. Mm, that's really up to you. But uh, this one. Fifty one eight six eight. Wow. And this was a ten one five one nine. By the way, don't pay attention to the um the Amazon English translation because the uh the uh name is probably very you know, incorrect here. But uh I'm looking right now for this uh ten dash one five one nine better put Kato just to make sure and 
and uh, that's one thing about um, hobby search as of late it seems like it's been a little tad slow but um, let's see if I can get another uh, here we go And this one cannot find it. So I'm not sure if this is the actual... Uh, but let's see the um, the, kind of the, uh, the whole uh, look of this case. So um, you got a cruise train. And that's it. Okay. Let's look at this. Wow, look at that. That is nice. Seven stars in Kyushu. Wow, that is elegant. That is really elegant. Look at that. LED lighting on the tables. Look at that. That is very nice. Um, yeah, it's a little... It's a... Uh, it's really interesting that, uh, yeah, I, I looked it up in Hobby Search right now, and I can't find this 10-1519. Uh, but I would say, though, that this is definitely a beautiful train. Very beautiful. What does this say right here? Can I get a Fukuoka, Nagasaki, Kumamoto, Saga? Oh, so they have the... Uh, names right here that is very cool I like that but again is it worth the I think this is probably one of the this one and the Mizukaze are probably one of the better ones I've seen that um, I got you know you know that it you know it's worth definitely looks expensive uh, this one goes about 387 so um, then that's used. <laughs> I don't know how much a new one goes for, but you're looking at these other ones here. Uh, the Legend Collections, um, they tend to go up in price, but the thing is, is that what was expensive back in, you know, 2010s may not apply now. I mean, even the, if the box is special, they ha Kato has done some re-releases, uh, renewals, and um, why get something that's made from at that time than, you know, getting something newer with much better technology, better motor, and, um, you know, some improvements made. Um, I think that's one of the things that, you know, collectors will have to decide on is that, for example, um, I'm a very big fan of Lego, and I could tell you that, uh, you know, Lego collections, you can pretty much uh, sell them, and there are, there's always going to be willing buyers, but there are, with Lego, um, there's, you know, obviously some improvements from, from within, uh, you know, the the 2010s to the 2020s compared to the uh, 1990s or so right now let's let's go to Star Wars you'll have your people who you have your fans who love the vintage stuff from the 19 like the original Star Wars from 1978 through the 80s with um, Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi and of course the look the look of the figures were not the best the paint was not the best, but for collectors, this is part of their childhood that they're nostalgic of, and they may not have the best articulation, And but there are people who are willing to pay a lot for them. For them. And that goes the same thing with uh, G.I. Joes and Transformers and so forth. There's always going to be a market of the older ones, but at the same time, there are um, newer releases that improved upon the that uh, from the original. And that's just how it is about the, you know, the toy or even the, the hobby industry is, 
it all comes down to how much one is willing to pay for it but when it comes to the legend collection and if you're going to buy it in 2022 um or 2023 i'm sorry um would you go for that same train that came out in 2010 and get it now well if it's never going to be released ever again then possibly uh for example um Modemo, the uh, you know from Hasegawa's uh, um, train uh, model um, brand, that is whatever train railway brand. <laughs> Get that all mixed up sometimes. But uh, the thing is, is that um, there are a lot of classic uh, trains and trams that they release. But they're never going to release them again. That's one thing about Modemo that uh, unless it's a renewal or if it has a special wrapping, that's the only time when you'll see a, um, you know, if there's some, you know, like a certain year where it was, you know, the actual train received certain, certain wrapping or a certain stylistic change, then it gives them a chance to release it. But uh, they go by their, their, their uh, you know, once you release it now, get it now or it's going to be too late <laughs> reseller is going to sell a lot of money and that's where for me there um there were like uh, the uh, inoshima or the inodens um that uh have been released and there's one that i really like such as it's called the meiji and in fact let me see if, it, if we can find it here um uh, Meiji NT 47. Okay. Uh, Mo, not, did I just type? Okay, here it goes. Yeah, Meiji Seika. Okay, here is just one from eBay. We're not. Uh, I don't want to use this. Well, I could show this. Okay, um, like this one right here. It's an older one that was released. Hmm, what mid two thousands? And of course, it doesn't have the new technology. It doesn't have the lamps. It doesn't have the uh, the tail lights, the lighting tail lights, or the lighting lamp headlamps. But this is the only time that you're going to get this, uh, you know, Meiji Seika version to be released. You know, you have the Kamakura, you know, Buddha right there. You have the, uh, you know, the uh, the gate right there, the Tori. And for me, I, you know, it was already, you know, I said I wanted that. It's going to be older. It still runs on a track. Um, you know, whether or not it has tail lamps or headlight you know headlights yeah that does make a big difference for me but for something older i'm willing to do that but i know it's never going to be released ever again so that's why i'm comfortable with modemo whereas kato um they'll re-release trains um almost every few years um i think i you know i talked about the was it the Thunderbird and that one has been released several times and then the um, Azusa that has been released several times and it was released in 2019 I'm getting the 2023 version that comes out slight differences uh, they make noticeable improvements but the thing is there's always an improvement every several years that I think that um, you know, something that was released from 2010 and you go all the way up to 2023, um, so much has changed then. Um, and I know that when it comes to in the U.S., um, I think if there's a big change, it's more on um, pricing of things, um, pricing of toys and so forth. I think many of you can remember a time when you can go to Walmart or Target and if you were looking for, it's a, a Transformer or action figure, you know it was going to be somewhere like $4.99 to $7.99. You go there today and it's almost like $18 to $20. 
and that's just for a little small action figure and you're like oh my gosh but in japan a lot of these are already priced expensively um as mentioned before uh in the u.s we can get hot wheels for cheap right well you give the equivalent <laughs> you do the equivalent to that with tommy tech and you're going to be spending a lot more um you know over over um what would be probably equivalent to 20 to 30 dollars us dollars <laughs> so there is a very very big difference and people are generally you know used to paying so much over there where we're used to paying so so little and I think that's just um, you know how things are are different um, between the two countries and uh, I think it just it just it's 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 just totally different when you when you uh, purchase things from Japan the magazines are more expensive the music CDs are more expensive the blu-rays you know and DVDs are more expensive um, granted they they put a little bit more of extra things let's say with the music CD or or blu-ray there's always some extra um, you know, like booklet or uh, some special concert DVD or blu-ray included with the music CD they do a lot of things um, to make you know extra things and it's why Japan has be is still the number two um, what do you call it when it comes to music sales they're the, the second largest music industry and even with uh, toys and hobbies there is a big following from people all over the world and yeah, that want to get their hands in in Japanese toys and I could tell you I was there in the beginning with the um, Pokemon franchise and um, when I was in Japan and I have to say this is probably about um, I probably 1999 I think like a year before that there was a Pokemon um, explosion in Japan where the, the anime um, the anime series was just so popular in the US not too many people had heard of them and um, I was there um, staying staying with a, a friend who was one of the first businesses to import um, Pokemon this is before um, they had major ties with um, you know a major um, toy company and he was doing some of these imports of this Pokemon uh, franchise that was you know popular in Japan but yet not known worldwide and um, I could just remember he he, he said well you, you know what this is for you, you know, this is for you as a gift and I just remembered it was like a Caterpie it was a uh, what was it it was not very popular ones but I know that one of the bigger ones that I got was a big Pikachu and uh, I was just amazed of wow this stuff is a very expensive and I think something like this in the US would cost you know really cheap and and uh, yeah, it's just, um, it, 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 I think that was one of my first foray into toys, and I think, of course, Gunpla. Um, I think Gunpla is rather inexpensive, and, uh, um, but I guess it depends on which version you want, because I know those master grades or those more expensive, not master grades, but the, um, the more higher priced ones can be very expensive, but, um, yeah, I mean, just everything. You just get used to that. I think if you've been buying Japanese goods for so long, you just get used to it. And I think this is the funny thing, is that when I was in Japan, when I ate there, I would see no problem spending, let's say, $20 on a burger, fries, and a drink. Because that's normal. And, of course, in Japan, they, they're more gourmet, right? Well, in the U.S., I don't think I'd do that. I don't think... I don't know. I guess I, I think when you're spoiled, um, you know, with a certain pricing. I think back then, you know, you got used to the $5 foot long from Subway. You got used to, well, back then when you had the dollar menus. Uh, I don't even know if they offer that because I don't really eat fast food anymore. But um, I know that you got used to the dollar menus and... and uh, Jeez, I don't know if if anyone remembers back when I was in college. Remember when McDonald's used to offer like burgers for 
like 39 cents or so. Uh, that was like, <laughs> um, that was like something, you know, that was rare at the time. And of course you got your little Caesars when they used to be $5. I don't think it's like that anymore, but I mean, that's how, you know, in the, in the U S I think we, we get so used to, uh, lower prices. And then when you go to Japan, you just kind of say, well, that's how it is. <laughs> you don't question it. You just say, uh, oh, that's how it is. And, you know, if you want to buy uh, a toy or if you want to buy a train that costs this much, this is how it is. And that's how my, my approach to even trains are. Um, some of these, you know, there, some people have like huge collections and you know already that the investment is quite high, especially if they have about 20 the 40 or 50 or more, you know, of these Kato or Tomix boxes. Because, you know, they spent a lot um, on them. And granted, um, you know, uh, it's... <laughs> I think I think that's just how it is. It, you just don't really question about it. It's the same with people who have Gunpla and they put it all over their shelves with a special lighting, LED lighting, and the special, uh, you know, they use a special glass, uh, certain really, you know, expensive drawer that's, well, some people, you, you could tell the difference between cheapy, um, a, a cheapy drawer versus a really high class, uh, hobby based, um, storage unit. So, but, uh, yeah. And I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here because I know you guys uh, who are listening to this, you probably have, you know, invested in something Japanese before or been to Japan and know how how pricing is usually. But but yeah, this is how things are with trains. And um, when it comes to these legend collections, are they worth it? It's really up to you. Personally, I would never purchase a legend collection if they are, if they, you get to look at, let's say, look at Hobby Japan uh, and see if, um, I mean, Hobby Search, not Hobby Japan, but Hobby Search, uh, 1999.co.jp. Do a search for it, look at the price, and then definitely click on the tab that shows that certain um, train series number. Because you could really see throughout the years of how many times um, Kato or even Tomix has done a release of that certain train. So, let's see here, looking at it some more and see if there's any other high-priced ones. A lot of these, of course, are people who um, who are just overpricing their their collections and I can understand they want to make some money get the Oda Q romance car and also this uh, or Taiwan bullet train this one is uh, looks very nice but they want you know 54,000 for it and uh, yeah there's uh, quite a few. Now, if you go look at the uh, the Tomix section here, get out of this one. And with Tomix, it looks like their big ones here are the uh, Goodbye Fuji Haya, you know Hayabusa. Sixteen cars. That is a lot. And when it comes to elegance, um, I looked and. Um, I think so far the most expensive one I have seen is it here. I think this is probably one of the more expensive ones. Um, but you know, then again, you're, you're you're getting a total of sixteen cars, so that's a lot. Considering that other places will only offer like eight, six or eight, you're getting uh, 16. So that is a pretty good deal. Actually, you know what? Let's go ahead and uh, let's copy and paste this one. 
and I'm gonna put, put you know put it in uh, hobby search let's do a check and the cost of this re when it was released was 46640 so it was already expensive the regular price was 52470 so yeah this one is this one is definitely expensive um, Tomix has another one that's very expensive here and this one is their um, goodbye freight set for the DD-51 and it, lo it looks like you have this huge fleet of Cokies and these other special looking petroleum cargo um, would I spend that much for a DD-51 even with a petroleum well considering that these are the huge petroleum ones because um, I have the smaller ones which are usually like 17 bucks um, mm, no you know what these are smaller because they're on Koki trains um, again it's up to you it's up to you I think uh, you know the train itself you could say you know 80 bucks but then you add these other ones with the JR logo one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve and then, then there's other ones the petroleum ones yeah I mean I could see it um, I could see probably 400 being tops but I can understand why this person selling it this much needs to make money. Um, the other one is this JR E4 series. It went 35.580. But yeah, that's Tomix for you. I mean, we're going to type this one right here. We're going to go ahead and look. And we're going to go to high to low. As you can see, the Tomix one also had a Goodbye Twilight Express. I do have this one, but I got it really, um, I got it for a really good price. Um, oh my gosh, what is this? This is probably the most expensive ones I've seen. Especially this. 165,000 yen. What the heck is this? It's the Twilight Express 98947. My gosh, how much did they? Let's see how much this one cost when it first came out. Okay, this one only costs about. Okay, Sayonara Twilight Express went for $56,320 320 yen in August 2015 so this person's pretty much tripling the price it was an expensive train train set no doubt you know you're, you're gonna be paying you know close to 400 over 450 dollars for this one but with that being said is it really worth that much well it's always uh, subjective to to you and how confident you are of spending that much. But again, uh, this one was released back in 2015. Uh, this one you get 15 cars and it includes, it's a limited edition. So um, this one came with... Yeah, it pretty much comes with the, uh, the main train, but I did see a blue one here, which I really can't see that well. I'm trying to look at the name here, because it looks like it comes with extra trains. So it comes with the DD-51s, two DD-51s, an ED-79, an EF-81. Okay, so you get, you do get a lot of extra ones here. 
And I think that's one I, I see now what they mean by sayonara because um, when uh, I recall that when the train was being retired, it was a DD-51 or so that had to pull the uh, the passenger cars at the end. Um, because I remember, if I recall, that certain train sections were sent to different areas and and uh, some places where they retired. Um, yeah, okay, that makes sense. That does make sense. But going back, can you see this other one here? I think these are the same, just different sellers. One wants it for 165, another one wants it for 163. And then you got this ambitious Japan at 152, 460. And the difference, of course, it has that ambitious Japan on the side. Um, but again, um, let's let's look at the uh, JR7 Ketomics 97397. Yeah. And let's see the original price for that. So it was thirty nine six hundred. So they definitely want four times as much. And that was released in November two thousand twenty one. <coughs> wow, that wasn't that was just November two thousand twenty one. I think it's because it comes with sixteen. But um, so it's a Takedo Takedo Sanyo Shinkansen. Ambitious Japan. 16 car set. Okay. So, as you can see here, there are collectors who are really wanting their money. Their money's worth. Um, I've always wanted this Thomas the Train, but not at this price. That is just crazy. But, yeah. Um, these special editions. I understand why they want so much, but... Um, yeah, it's only as good as one wants to pay for it. Looks nice, but, but yeah, it depends on how much one wants to pay. And you can see more right here. You can see the, uh, Sayonara Naha Akatsuki from two, uh, 2008. And I'm not sure when it was released, the release date was. And then you have these other ones like the Shinano. 300 series right there. So the thing is, is you get these Tomix um, limited edition of uh, the Sayonara trains, the goodbye. And I think it pays a good respect. You get a snazzy case. But again, you have to look up how often they're being re-released. I think if anything is that to me, for a limited edition, they should release it once and never again. If they really want to drive up that, that collectible, we see people doing that for certain for certain type of special editions, and you know it's the only time you'll see that release. And you know you just jump at it, or you, you know save up for it or something. But if they are going to release a limited edition, then two or three or four or even five years later they release another version not limited edition but comes with a basic set or comes with you know uh, an extension add-on set and it just it just you know i don't know i, I don't spend this much definitely i'm not going to spend over one hundred twenty-nine thousand yen but you ask yourself, is it really worth that much? And, um, you know, sometimes I've, <laughs> I, I think, um, when it comes to toys, I remember there was a GI Joe, uh, storm shadow that I saw at a target store. And, and then there was this other one and people were wanting it for like, eighty eighty dollars for something that I only spent like four dollars and I'm like are people really spending that much on uh, on these little figures here and I said well might you know let's see and next thing you know I put I think I found like a total of like f three or four at the, at the at the target store and I put them on for sale and I said wow this must be rare obviously it wasn't rare for me they had it still on the shelves it's just right there like three or four of them i got them and 
put them up and see how much those bids would go and they kept on surpassing like 80 you know 80 bucks to over 100 bucks i'm like wow that is just intense so there's always people willing to pay that much willing to pay a lot um but for me because they continually re-release certain trains it, it's it's a hard thing to uh to invest in knowing that with every newer year there's going to be you know better technology or something better i then again i don't know about one th well i don't know about one thing let's see here uh when it comes to trains back then was there a difference in quality and the reason why i say that is i remember when i was a child and there was a popular mecca series and it was released in japan and they released it in the u.s and it was called shogun warriors now shogun warriors were made with die cast steel they were as heavy as f it, <laughs> they use pure steel heavy steel and these robots they were not made of plastic well you know well actually some parts were made of plastic but they did things that you know that you don't see in today's uh you don't see in today's uh, game, you know, like, uh, you know, Mecha releases Transformers or whatever. Um, everything is plastic these days. But back then, I, I just remembered it was all made, made of metal. You know, you hold it and you drop it on your knuckle. You're going to hurt yourself. I remember there was one called Guy King. In fact, let's see. If I could do Ray, right, let's see if I could show you this. Warriors Guy King. There we go. Okay. As you can see here, these are plastic. But back then, okay, that was a regular one. I had this one too. But there was a steel one wasn't a guy king mattel oh here it is this one doesn't have the arms but let me bring it up here yeah uh look better than this but this the whole thing was all steel it was heavy steel um they came with the arms that shot they were spring activated um hands there was a button right here that you could hold your um, your your the, the mecha's body, and by pressing a button, these heavy legs would fall. Like you could drop it, like a you know, like some type of weapon that you know that that could demolish your other toys because it was that heavy. Um, there's the buttons right here. Right, I think that was it. And then yeah, the the it releases the the legs, but um, yeah, could you believe it? They actually released this in the U.S. at one time. They were Popey, and Mattel took it on and released it. And after this, never again would I see. Well, maybe Transformers, I think. But I wonder though, if if the you know we knowing that uh, Tomix and other companies made trains a long time ago. I sometimes wonder for myself, as I've never had anything that old that that's that old. I think uh, the last one I, I, I showed everyone was the uh, the older Kiha uh, number two from Tomix that I had. But other than that, I sometimes wonder about the 70s or so, or even the 60s when they had their first trains. How heavy were they? How was the quality? Were they metal? Or they would. <laughs> Those are things I, I've, I've not seen for myself with my own eyes. It would be interesting to explore, especially get your hands on it. But again, I think that's a that's a hardcore collector type of thing. But yeah, I, that's one thing that um, I often think about is uh, the quality of materials uh, compared from now to you know from what how things were back then i think does anyone remember the voltron series 
I think uh, wasn't there at the time it was also made of metal then later on it became more plasticky <laughs> yeah a lot has changed how long have we been going for here I know we've been going on for oh over over 45 minutes so let me go ahead and go to our next segment here. okay so let's go to this segment here of let's torikatsu and this is the BS Fuji Japan train show that goes into trains and also model trains and it's hosted by um, uh, by uh, Kuno Tomomi um, she does not like to be called Tetsuko so <laughs> she wants to be uh, called uh, Joshi Tetsu if I recall and uh, she is one of the well-known names when it comes to uh, trains um, where you see a lot of train idols uh, on the female and the male side she is um, a train connoisseur you could say she's also one that uh, visits a lot has written numerous books and she has you know has done many shows been featured on many blu-ray dvds and even uh even on audio uh even in the anniversary of, or so of, of uh the railway in japan she's she was featured on a audio cd and um yeah she's quite popular but i'm not going to play this whole thing because of, you know due to copyrights but um this one is uh they're visiting yokohama and the main is that um, the first railway was opened back in September 12, 1872. And um, they wanted to create a uh, railroad track from Yokohama, which is now um, Yokohama Station, which is now Sakuragicho. Sakuragi and then there's the Shinbashi in Tokyo. So believe it or not, they, a one-way trip took 53 minutes in comparison to 40 minutes of a modern electric today, uh, train today. So <clears throat> you'd think it'd be a lot faster, right? But uh, just to, you know, how things were back then, back in 1868, uh, the Scottish merchant Thomas Blake Glover, he brought the first steam locomotive, the Iron Duke, to Japan. And he demonstrated an eight-mile track in Nagasaki, um of how a train works and had the benefits it could bring to Japan. But of course, um, the distrust towards outsiders in Japan at the time, um, especially if you look in the history of Japan and the, uh, from the feudal lords to the, uh, you know, how they did not, how they were pretty much isolated from the world and they did not want any exporting and importing, even though it was, it was done under, uh, under well, I don't want to say under the table but they was still done they found ways of doing it but um, yeah when it came to doing having trains it was un unacceptable to have a railway constructed by outsiders so what uh, the government of Japan did was they built a railway from Yokohama to Tokyo um, while the British financed the railroad and they had like 300 British and European technical advisors, including civil engineers, general managers, locomotive builders, and, and drivers. Um, I think that uh, they received a lot of help. You had British engineer Edmund Morrell, who supervised the construction of the first railway in Honshu. And then you also had American engineer Joseph U. Crawford, uh, who supervised the construction of a coal mine railway in Hokkaido. That was in 1880. And uh, there was a German engineer, Hermann Rumschuttel, or Rumschuttel, I don't know how you say that. But he supervised the railway construction in Kyushu in 1887. Uh, Japanese engineers would be trained by them. And the uh, interesting thing is that two of those uh, Japanese engineers trained by Joseph Crawford, the American engineer, they would later become the presidents of the Japanese or the Japan National Railways, JNR. But anyway, um, 
this episode of Kuno with with Kuno Tomomi, she is joined by the inter- her, I think it was her entertainment manager for Hori Pro at one time, Minamida Yusuke, who's a hardcore railway fan, and Professor Tamura Kisuke, who is the Department of Environmental Design at Showa Women's University, and also spotlighting the event, uh, the Yokohama uh, Railway event that she attended. I think it's called the Railway Model Festa. Um, but anyway. Um, she talks about the, you know, um, she introduces uh, the uh, earliest locomotives, like the Type 110, and then she interviews uh, the two um, about, um, you know, the trains that were available and how there was no passenger cars that survived, but because everything was made of wood, the passenger car was able to be reproduced thanks to the images that they took back then. Um, you can see this, oh, that's Minamita right there, but... Um, yeah, you could see the the train. Uh, they really um, they took a lantern and that was used at the time, and you could see it up and above when they show it. But um, let's see here. But anyway, um, yeah, they they tried to rebuild it. Of course, they're not gonna. Here it is, right here. It's LED. <laughs> but yeah, they were able to uh, reproduce it, and it's uh, featured in uh, in Yokohama. Um, Let's see here. But anyway, what what uh, um, what Kuno's uh, guest, uh, the professor Tamuro, did is that he and his group of teens. Let me bring this here. They would make these um, skeletal, these skeletal um, versions of Yokohama Station, and they talked about how Yokohama, Yokohama Station began with this type of station it was it was just a long platform here and that was it and then it would just gradually um, change and be updated over the years to what it is now and I was just looking at this I'm just like wow this is a very impressive but um, one thing I found very impressive is uh, let's see if we could uh, find uh, here it is it was this this one shows you how how when they when how the uh, first stations in Japan looked. So Yokohama and Shinbashi, right? And they were of course made by American influence, and both were very similar. So they joked around that you ride for nearly an hour, and by the time you get there, you arrive at a station that looks almost exactly the same. And that's, I guess, that's how it is. Uh, they didn't really um, give it their it, their own personality uh, for the station at the time. But um, if anything, the main difference was the Yokohama platform uh, looked like an upside down L, while the Shinbashi platform looked like a T, T shape, which uh, they would later shift. Uh, Yokohama Station, of course, was moved, and um, and. Um, it's it's uh it's close to the area which is present day uh Take, takashi macho station um the original yokohama station was later renamed of course to sakuragicho station but um one of the reasons why the station was moved to a new location was it was to allow yokohama to continue to go to tokyo but they also wanted to build a path where it would go west uh, towards uh, Kyoto and Osaka, if I recall. And uh, another thing is that when, you know, a year before the second station was being built, Tokyo Station was just unveiled. And it was a brick building that looked absolutely luxurious. But of course, eight years later, the station was damaged due to the Great Kanto earthquake of 1922. But it's, uh, if you, I mean, if you, even if you, even today, you visit, uh, Tokyo Station. It's one of the most beautiful looking stations out there. Um, I'm just enamored. I mean, when I go to Tokyo Station, I I like to go to the building across. Um, and there's an area, there's a restaurant where you could go outside and you could just sit there and just take photos of the, uh, the whole Tokyo Station, especially day and night. Night, I highly recommend it. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, I went during the winter, so it, it wasn't too late, but it was, uh, I think it was like uh, at, I think 5 p.m. 
when it started getting dark and when all the lights were on and oh, it's just it's just a beautiful sight to look at but even if you go inside Tokyo uh, station and just seeing the, the just the how well decorated it's just really really impressive so I hope many of you who go to Japan um, well I'm not gonna say Tokyo station is the most convenient because it can be very confusing but at least hopefully you can enjoy the architecture of it um, but yeah, uh, Kuno then talked about the 205 series, um, which was produced from 1988 to 2014, and how these special uh, uh, destination signs are now being sold. Uh, There's a set for 66,000 yen. Um, then she shows off the 22, I mean, we, um, the 20, uh, 22 model, the Yokohama Station, which Tamura created. And he said that it's, it looks like a monster. <laughs> Let's go back to it. Let's see here. Here it goes. Yeah, this is just, you know, these are the the, the railroad platforms here. But he said that uh, while it may look like a monster, it's very functional. And he created this using a CAD and a machine that helped make the pieces. So um, he talked about how detailed the skeletal station model looks. And Minamita joked with him, you know, joked about it saying, you know, did you have to, you know, you, you must really worked hard to make everything look so precise and so forth. But Tom credits the team of students who were involved in the project. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, then the, um, the show obviously shifts to the to the Tokyo, um, the, well, not to Tokyo, the Yokohama Railway Model Festival 2023. And I believe, you know, I'm um, sorry if I got the names incorrectly, but I believe this is correct. You got uh, Suzuki Masayuki of Tomitech right here. You got, um, I think this right here is the Sakine Akihiro of Green Max. And this one, I believe, and I could be wrong, but I believe this is um, Mori Kazuhe of Katsume. This one, I think, is Sudo Naoki of Tenshudo. And for Kato, we have uh, Kawasaki Futoshi. So the question that they were asked during the panel with uh, Kuno and Minamita um, was, um, let's see here, what was it again? It was something that had to do about um, how, how long does it come when you have a plan um, you know, when you have a plan to make a train, a model train, and um, commercializing it, how long is the process? And I believe they said that um, that takes about six months or so. Uh, Tommy Tech Suzuki told the audience that it actually takes longer than most people think for a product to come out. About six months for Tomix. Tomix, he is told that it would become. He told he is told by the, the makers that it'll take about um, six months, uh, but um, or completed by a certain time. But during that time, when they you know for the announcements, they like to get input from people. Um, they like they love listening to their customers, and I think the way he emphasized that is really awesome. And uh, another reason why Tomix um, has a good fandom because you know they listen to what their fans say, even though uh, with uh, there's you know of course you know quality differences between Kato. Both are you know really good rivals that push each other, but I think of uh, if anything, it's just that. Um, I, I like hearing that how Tomix listens to their customers, so that that's a good that's a good thing. Um, the other one, um, oh uh, Mori of Katsumi, he said that uh, they have four stores and they always like to ask their customers what would they like to see next, and th and then they do research uh, conducted that way um, by asking their patrons or the customers of what they want to see. Um, the question then they asked is uh, Minamita was, was asking, um, or even I think Kuno was asking that, uh, what are the chances of a C11 steam locomotive being made? Uh, Suda of Tenchudo talks about the JNR Class C11, 207, the JR Hokkaido steam locomotive, and um, I believe uh, Kato Kawasaki said 
it's difficult because there are a lot of things to consider, especially if customers are wanting it in a different format. So I think that's uh, that brings something that's that's really interesting is uh, I, I often wonder about that. You see things with uh, like different paints or so forth. I am not too familiar with the C11 uh, JNR class. 207 and I just don't I don't know how many variations of that there are but um, I do like the fact that he says that um, there's a lot of things to consider especially if customers are wanting a certain style format versus you know the original so I think that's really interesting uh, the other train that was brought up is the Toki the um, EMU Tokyo 7500 series inspection car and uh, Mori Kazuhe said it's been 45 years since they commercialized the product as they released they, they as they released the one over 80 version. Um, they asked Sakina Akihiro of Green Max about creating an engaged version. Um, but Sakina said that while there would be many fans of it, Green Max has their own set of core fans and there there would be division among their core fans and the fans of what, you know, would want to, uh, the you know non hardcore fan so i think that's good that he 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 makes a um he he made that uh comment because you know green max is unlike tomix and um tomix and kato they release what they want and they were a model company where when they first started you had to build and paint your own trains and um even today, even though there's things, there's trains that are pre, you know, pre, they're already made and finalized, and they also have structures that are done, you know, that are built and finalized. They are still doing and releasing um, model hobby kits where you still have to paint. Um, in fact, I'm looking at a. It's one of their uh, their traditional Japanese structures. It's beautiful, and both uh, come with the same amount of parts, but. Um, everything is all silver except the glass windows or so that you that are colored in light blue or brown that you could uh, you could put uh, you know behind the windows but everything is yeah everything is all silver gray and you have to either paint it I left it as is because I thought you know what the, I'm, I'm pretty good with that I um, if anything I should have done is I probably because everything is all like gray I, I wish I before I glued those parts, I wish I at least spray painted maybe the uh, the top, the top areas, the roof. Because now I kind of have regrets of keeping everything gray. At first I didn't mind, but now that I look at it and I'm staring at it right now, I'm just like, ah. Oh. But yeah, uh, all good for Green Max for, uh, for um, bringing up their core fans. So... Um, then they show the Green Max's Placer and Thur, the uh, Thor, the GM4709, and uh, Minamida said to Mori that if he sold the Toki, it would sell well. But Sakina said they did do an inspection train, but it was the Techno Inspector Oda Q31. So the Sanjuichi. But Minamiya said he will check out other business vehicles for each company, but says that as people can see from, from the panel, when it comes to making model trains, there's all there's always a lot of consideration, and it seems that um, the major consideration is their what their fans really want, and um, I think that the fact that they listen to their fans again is a big plus. That's one thing I love about this show. Uh, you can see the passion among their of the creators, but also the respect, the level of respect they have for each other's work. Um, you'll often see the other, you know, a lot of them, co you know, commenting on, oh, Tomix release this, this is so awesome, and, you know, um, oh, you, you guys make so you know, awesome containers, and then you'll have the other um, group, you know, saying the Kato, oh, this was an awesome release, so I, I think this is the first time I've seen Green Max's participation, um, I could be wrong, but, uh, but, um, Usually it's, you know, other other uh, train makers because there's quite a few in Japan. It's just oh, they just don't get, a, you know, that much of a plug. Well, they do get a plug, well, through advertisements and RM models, but uh, that's if you get that magazine. But 
in terms of videos. I tend to only see the usual, uh, the usual people, especially Kato and Tomix or Tomi Tech. Okay. Um, the next discussion they also had was the JR Alpha X, the Class E nine five six. Let's see if they have uh, up there. Oh, this is the Toki, the one over eighty that he they created. And this is that um, that Techno Inspector that they released back then. But if I can get to the... Here it goes. I don't know here. Oh, come on. There we go. So this is the JR Alpha X, the Class E956 Experimental Shinkansen train that was unveiled by JR East back in 2019. And they asked them, what is the chances of one of you guys making this? And immediately when they looked at it, and uh, well, some of them who already knew it, they said it would be challenging because the mold, it, just looking at the front train itself, and they're explaining the process of how they make molds. This would be very challenging to make. And, um, yeah, I think it was, uh, was it Mori or so that uh, said that uh, he joked around. Uh, he said, oh, it would be a max challenge. But he said he was scolded for saying something unnecessary the day before. So he needs to stop, especially if fans mistake it as, oh, they're going to do this. Uh, Kuno then ends that with that in April. He will be working um, with, she will be in the show, will be working with uh, JR Kyushu. And they will be featuring the 36 plus 3 Express 787 Luxury Train. Let's see if it uh, shows that right here. I'm trying to get to an uh, image of that train here. I get it, then it, uh, oh well. Oh, well. Oh, there it is. Okay, so this is going to be an interesting uh, um, episode in April, so I think that's going to be cool. This is a really nice looking luxury train right there. But yeah, that is the latest of um, um, of uh, Torikatsu. That's Torikatsu. Uh, episode 12. Uh, they released episodes. There's, I believe there's quite a few of them, but... Um, Again, you just go to the BS Fuji official channel, and then you just scroll down, and you will find a section right here. That's Torikatsu, and you click on it, and you can see the, all the episodes. There's 12 episodes right now. I highly recommend it if you have a chance. It's it's really it's really fun, and um, even if you don't know Japanese. Uh, you could just look at the trains or even, you know, look at the model trains and just enjoy it. Um, I will be doing translations for the, these episodes or even just talking about it on my on this podcast. But I've done translations on this and um, it's not the most perfect or most thorough translation. But I just want to give the gist of the, what the episode is about. And um, yeah, I'll probably start doing that with the uh, uh, past episodes as well. And, uh, yeah, that is pretty much it, everyone. Uh, we went for a full hour and uh, over an hour. And I uh, hope you enjoyed this episode of The J and uh, the Tetsudo Moke edition. And uh, before I go, I, I just want to say that, um, you know, for, for those of you who are um, wanting to get into the hobby of... Uh, of trains I think that it's one of the, the most awesome hobbies to get into especially for the Japanese trains um, again you can uh, visit there's forums that you can jo go online there's also websites blogs a lot of things you can find out there but it's one of the coolest communities that are very helpful to people um, it's also it also has a different dem demographic than you would see with most hobbies um you know they don't 
it's not like with with gunpla you have you you have a lot of young people and uh you know they entice a lot of young people to get into the hobby and and you you have a lot of people who are now able to get that from various stores and i hope i hope maybe one of these days and i was just thinking about this uh um today is like do you think there would be a time where we would see a kato or even a tomix train a japanese train being released in the u.s of course licensing i understand that but i mean if gunpla and i know it's it's all different from each company to company but if gunpla can be sold at a target and then to see the gunpla related um tools like for weathering or even the um the rail pins pens that are sold there's a lot of japanese products now being sold on hobby lobby japan and that was never like that before you think about it back then when you want to get your gunpla or the the gunpla pens or the weathering tools um for the japanese releases you would have to go through amazon japan or ebay right but now they're just easily available and for a great price so i think that's one thing that that um you know something i was thinking about because i had to um purchase a a um cherry blossom uh trees from kato and i went through amazon japan and you know it was about about 10 bucks or so for for three and I was just thinking, I was like, man, wouldn't that be wonderful in one of these days, Hobby Lobby, like they do with the, the Gunpla, would be able to be carrying um, Kato-related items from the minifigures or even structures. We know there's Kato USA, and they sell stuff, but I would love to, you know, one of these days, I'm not sure if it's going to be my lifetime or... Uh, how, how many lifetimes <laughs> of other generations but i um i just hope that uh you know for those who are passionate about trains and the hobby they will get easier access um the hobby is not the cheapest and it's not the most friendliest for people who are wanting to get into the hobby um, and jump into it quickly. There's a lot of considerations. And, of course, you know, some of you, you know, have learned that, of course, and I talked about it before, the basic sets that you can get from Kato and Tomix are wonderful. Um, you know, just for the train alone, it's it's worth it. For the train and the passenger trains or cargo trains, um, you get so much for your money. And... You, then you get the power controller and the tracks. And if you could get it for like, what is it, $35 US? <coughs> it's like $50 or 5,000 5, yen or so in on Amazon Japan. That is just way worth it. That's affordable. But the thing is, is that the more you get into the hobby... It becomes limiting because, you know, you have to factor in um, shipping, shipping costs. And that's where it gets expensive. So you say, OK, you pay twenty six dollars for the first item and then you add a second item. Then it goes up to uh, by another nine hundred yen. Then you add another third item, which, which goes by another nine hundred yen. And it kind of adds up. And uh, I've actually did some tests on Amazon Japan and I said, OK, I'm getting all these Modemo um, trains, and interesting enough, the uh, shipping didn't go up. But then, once you add, you know, a magazine, you know, or if you add a uh, other thing like the diorama stuff, then you start to see it go up like crazy. And uh, yeah, that's the only thing that you know with Amazon Japan working gets it gets a little insane. The interesting thing is that when you uh, check out and you go to priority and you, you see priority and standard shipping for global and the sometimes the global priority is way cheaper and uh, it was really interesting I think it was uh, just the other day I was ordering something and 
I saw that I'm like, okay, supposedly the standard shipping, you know, you could, it's going to take another week maybe for several days longer, but you just have to, you know, it says here that you pay like only, you know, you'll pay like, like 3,000 to 5,000 yen less. But then when I was uh, going through that and looking at the overall total and I'm like, wait a minute, going priority, global priority is much cheaper. Even though they show the shipping charge, somehow in the end, in the final tally, they're the final, you know, price of the, with everything together, it's a lot more um, if I went standard. So I tend to st stay with priority, stay with priority um, for global shipping when it comes to Amazon. But um, yeah, I think uh, you can find a lot of good deals. Um, again, if you're just doing a single train, and you don't plan to order much, then eBay is great. But I, you know, I definitely would look into Amazon, Japan, Ami Ami, and other train companies to see if you can take advantage of the deals they have when it comes to shipping. Um, yeah, that's all I have to say. Is just yeah, um, a lot of cool releases coming out. So definitely. Um, yeah, you know, keep on doing your research and just enjoy the hobby for what it is. And uh, and I hope that um, you know, I really do hope that um, the the enthusiasm that I have towards train collecting and you know I I hope that I can communicate that with people who are listening because yes I collect a lot of stuff, but the thing is with trains and. Uh, the building of a diorama and everything. There's just something you just feel cool about about it, and it be it becomes my my new source of just you know some a piece I guess you could say. Um, I've had a major aquarium where I had a lot of fish, but I can't tell you that uh, you know it gave me the the best peace and serenity. Considering you have to clean it a lot, especially if you have a big aquarium tank and you have to clean it a lot and you have to feed it and spend a lot of money on that. And there's just so many other factors. And it was, uh, for me, I think, um, um, you know, sometimes I think, you know, what, I'm glad I don't have my super large aquarium anymore because now I have this diorama and I'm just having just as fun and just love seeing, you know, just having my trains run on the track and there's just something calming about it yeah you have your derailments but uh, if anything it's just i think that's part of the um part of the the fun of having control of your own diorama and your own railroad tracks of setting things up trying to figure it out and just trying to make it all work um another thing is just that that i've done um, also recently is I, I went through the lighting and um, as I mentioned I went through Evans Designs to get the LED lighting that I put in my buildings but I started to use those for now I, I transferred a lot of the LED lighting that I used for the big buildings I put those towards the smaller buildings and for the bigger ones I'm, I decided to go with puck lights and puck lights are pretty much the ones that are small LED lights um, about one, maybe I say about two inches or so. And, um, yeah, they are controllable by remote control. Uh, you can, you know, change it to different colors and they're battery based. So they're like, uh, they're, you know, they use, uh, AAA batteries and I had quite a few, so it's all good. Um. So I'm like experimenting with different batteries. I have one that runs off uh, AA, then I have another one that runs off 9 volt. And this one I do like because it's remote control based and you can control the, the puck lights easy and just turn it off and they give really good lighting. Um, how would you put the puck lights in a Kato building or a Tomix building? Well, that, that's where um, so again, so certain Tomix buildings have layers, so you could just put it in there. And the Toyoko Inn has a big, um, you could, you know, again, snap off the bottom to reach in there. But with Kato and Tomix, some of the buildings, you kind of have to um, remove some of the interior layers, like the two bottom ones. 
I've had to do that. And then uh, just re, I would have to glue things back, like certain windows, so they wouldn't move around. But that's to me, that's okay. I'm willing to do that if I can get lighting in the building. And so by putting the puck lights and using the double stick tape, um, I'm able to achieve that. Uh, again, I, I think uh, if it's an easy way to put it in there, twist it, and then you can remove the batteries and replace them easily. Uh, and again, you get the remote controls. So uh, a lot of places on Amazon, you could get like um, three three puck light sets with a remote, and they come with a total of two of those sets. So you're getting six total, and the same remote control will work perfectly. Um, the other one that I ended up doing with the big high-rise, Tomix high-rise, was using um, side rail lights for that were used for vehicles, but they're small, tiny ones, um, and then powering it with a 9-volt battery. And um, if I had to do it again, because I already installed the LED lights for that big high-rise, and I don't want to take anything apart, it just took too long. Um, but if I had to do it again, I would use the puck lights on that, uh, the Tomix Shin Yamanote, um, building because those puck lights really work well. I mean, they really work well for the buildings. Good amount of brightness, better than the, uh, the LEDs in terms of the single LEDs or even using three LED lights because that tends to add up when you're, when they're, even though they're $5 each. To get that same amount of brightness, you could do it with puck lights easier. So, again, that's P U C K uh, puck lights, LED lights. Look that look, look that uh, up on Amazon. You'll find a you know good pricing for that, and they will go inside those buildings and light them up. So, um, but what else is there? I think that is pretty much it. Um, I'll do reviews later. There's quite a few reviews that. Um, I'm working on at the moment um, and let's see and I think the next thing I'm going to be doing is um, adding some ballast um, and then using the bond I have not done that yet so because um, a lot a lot of has changed with my setup um, it keeps on evolving to tell you the truth so and um, yeah um, that's about it. I'm sorry. I think I'm rambling now, but uh, you all have a good week, and I'll see you later. Bye-bye.